Dear Father, God, we come to you in life with towers we are building. And you're not a tower builder for us. You have one ladder, Jesus, who reaches from earth to heaven. He's the tower. So tear down our towers and build your altars on holy ground. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was a young boy, I had a dream of building a treehouse. Anybody ever build a treehouse around here? Oh, come on, you must have some exciting entrepreneurial treehouse builders here. I, I built a treehouse, and I, I wanted, and I envisioned before I did this how I could reach high into the sky, and I could sit or lay down in that treehouse, look up there, and I could think of noble thoughts without the limitations of planet Earth. A treehouse is awesome. Now, we want to build a treehouse in the back here or something like it at Reaching Hearts for the Kids. I've got to get permits through Prince George's County. It's not simple, believe it or not, but we're going to do it. Because kids ought to have a place where they can climb, it's safe, and they can look up and they can think of where we're going. We're going to heaven. Now, the ancients pictured the universe as a tree, just like I would. I think of the big universe, big tree, universe. The top is heaven that towers high, and we live at the bottom of the tree on level ground down here. And all the elements surrounded by the tree was part of the cosmic tree principle in antiquity. Angels are birds. You know in Daniel 4, this cosmic tree that Nebuchadnezzar rec- represents, the birds came and roosted in the tree. That means angels came. Extraterrestrials visited this planet. Watchers stood in the branches of the tree and observed international Uh, events in his kingdom. The same is true today. There are birds that have visited here today, angels from other realms that are right here in this room. As a boy, I looked up out of the window of my house every morning, admiring the sky up high. By the way, I went to Google Earth and also some of these real estate companies. They have renovated our our old, ugly house. It's now worth about $100,000. I can't believe it. That was a piece of junk. I mean, we, we grew up, I mean, I'm telling you, I grew up in very humble conditions, and somebody has made that thing look pretty. As a boy, I looked out the window of my house every morning on 122 Middleton Street, Galax, Virginia, admiring the sky up high, and I noticed a tall pine tree that towered high up toward the sky, just beyond my yard in the back part of the street, that little complex, in Middleton, on Middleton Street, like Middle Earth, maybe. And as I looked at that tall tree, I imagined tall poles. Here's Google Earth of where I used to live. And I looked for that pine tree, and it's gone. We built a tree house in that pine tree. The tree house is gone. The pine tree is gone. Someone cut down the towering tree. Now you can say, aw, that would help. It's very sad. They cut down the tree. But as I looked at that time, at that tall tree, I imagined tall poles fastened to the side of that tree like stilts with a, good, with a wood deck high on top of them and a tree house on the top of the deck. And I have discovered in life that dreams become reality when you put a little vision, a little effort, a little planning to work, and your dream can come true. Uh, does God fulfill dreams for lazy people? No. Dreams happen when we show our faith by working toward a goal, Right? So, now I wasn't a believer back then. In fact, I was not a believer at all. I was an unconverted brat back then. Unfortunately, I lived in Appalachia where money was hard to earn. We had just come from a very poor country house to this little inner city home. Galax was the city. But boy, it was like the Bronx where I lived. And I lived in Appalachia where money was hard to earn, where resources were next to nothing, and where community pessimism kept you down all the time if you tried to climb out of the hole of that local poverty situation. And as a young boy, I worked a paper route to buy food since my mom's job at the furniture factory at minimum wage would barely do. As a boy, I fished a lot to make sure I had food on the table. We didn't really eat together, we just kind of ate. And I cooked the fish and the like. Anybody here ever have to fish for a living? I went fishing to survive. Now, my brother, Tim, in Florida just recently, Andrew, just give me a little hair more on that mic. My brother, Tim, in Florida, just, just a hair, so I can back away from the distance here. My brother, Tim, and thank you, just to, thank you, that's a little too much, just back it off. My brother, Tim, in Florida, that's it. My brother, Tim, in Florida, communicated with me this week. And he said, I hate fishing. I said, Tim, let's go fishing together. He says, I hate it because I used to have to fish for a living, and now I don't want to have anything to do with it. 
Now, some of you all went fishing with us in the, in the youth fishing trip, and I noticed that we had some people show up who weren't youth, but they looked youthful as they caught the fish with the kids. In short, the money was not there to build a treehouse. As I dwelled upon my dream, day after day, in time I solicited the help of my best friend Jeff to get the job done, to build a tower of our own making, to make it happen, to put that treehouse up. Now Jeff had some problems. He was on the low end of the ethical scale, and hanging around him put me at the bottom end of the moral scale, frankly. And as we thought about how to get it done, the Ten Commandments never mattered to us at all. Let's do it any way we can. Scheming and devising, Jeff conjured a sinister scheme to visit the local rough-cut lumber yard at the bottom of the hill at night and to steal and move some of that fine rough-cut lumber up the hill to the tall pine tree, one board at a time. He even had a, 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 cat, cat, a mask and a cape so he looked like Batman and Robin. It was awful. And we, we would go and we took that stuff and we went right up the hill and we stole all that lumber. After Jeff figured out how to, by the way, I was baptized after this. I'm not glorifying this. I'm just telling you what happened. After Jeff figured out how to steal the lumber, I drew up a makeshift architectural building plan, a drawing of our future treehouse yet to be realized. I had no idea I'd be involved in building churches later in life. This was not a church. And we determined that we need a number of small poles and many board feet of lumber and some nails and waterproofing material also. And we noticed in the house that was being built nearby, there was, a, there was a box of nails, there was paint. We found the boards. Everything was coming together. We just stole it. That's all. So he also spotted some cans of waterproofing paint and so on. And so as we got all that together, we collected it, brought it up there. As Frank Sinatra said in his famous song, I did it my way. Well, we did it our way, not God's way. It took many nights and much breaking of God's law, a law we didn't care about at that time to get it done. I remember when the Holy Spirit was moving on me at the age of 15 to leave that hometown. And there was a conversion in process as God was working on my hard heart. I appealed to Jeff to leave and go with me to Fletcher Academy and start over with Jesus. And he would have none of Jesus. And I, I've had no real interaction with him since. I hope you pray for Jeff. But that's how we built our tower. We built our treehouse our way. I remember when we finally finished the treehouse. It seemed too good to be true. It was tall, it was strong. It towered high in the sky. We carpeted it with carpet that we got somewhere from someone. Now when you build a tower at someone else's expense, the whole idea loses its beautiful grandeur, doesn't it? In time I felt bad because of how we did it. I felt bad that we did it our way and not God's way. I felt like tearing down the treehouse and starting all over again. Friend, there are times in life we build our own towers and we make them high to glorify ourselves, to make ourselves look good. And God is not in the business of making us look good. God is in the business of giving glory to his character, which is humble for the saving of men and women. We build towers to impress others. Much of what passes as church activity can be narcissistic unless the focus is evangelistic for the saving of men and women to the glory of God. We build towers to feel good about ourselves. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you traverse land and sea to make a single convert. But you're the ones that need to be converted, he implies. Friend, God cares about us. He'll tear a tower down so we can build an altar to him in life. And in our pride, we build towers to show God maybe that we can get to heaven on our own, in our own way, without his law, without his gospel clearly defined in the New Testament, without a relationship with him, without his grace and his mercy manifested the cross on our behalf. Somehow we think that the church is better than the Savior in our proclamation of truth. Friend, God raised up this movement to appoint men and women to Jesus Christ at the time of the end with prophetic clarity. Not for our sake, but for his sake and for the lost's sake. In the Desire of Ages, page 35, this profound statement is made that describes the tower builder kind of religion that would climb up to God instead of kneeling down to God at an altar seeking grace from God on level ground. The Jews had created a system of righteousness by works. They had access to the book of Daniel, the prophecies of Isaiah, and they did not utilize them correctly. The author writes, Desire of Ages, page 35, the principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. 
It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle. Wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. Herman Melville wrote in Marty in a voyage thither that great towers take time to construct. You don't get to where the Jewish people were overnight. It takes time to compromise, to lose your way, to let the scriptures slip away, to reject the spirit of prophecy's practical impact in our lives. To finally you find yourself morphing to something you never thought, building a tower of your own righteousness instead of surrendering to the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Friend, we can spend a lifetime building a tower, but they are only sandcastles in time that come down when life ends. The wind erodes the pyramids. The rivers flow through the greatest of cities in time to make a canyon deep. A time itself wears away at dreams and tears as tears in time wear down every tower we build for our joy. So tower builders fail in the end. In our weak pursuit of towers, life is full of problems, and entropy has a way of undoing our best efforts. Dylan Burroughs once wrote, Our problems may tower over us, but God towers over our problems. Now that is true, and that is comforting, and that is wise. But let me share something with you. But maybe God is the ultimate tower in our life who tears down our towers so we can come to heaven in the right way. You see, we build our own platforms, our own stuff, our own goodness. And God tears that down so that as we are lowered in the dust, righteousness by faith can be realized in the heart and we can be elevated by humility and brokenness to realize that Jesus is Jacob's ladder. That our right to heaven is a righteousness, a right now righteousness, not based on our works of law, but on the goodness of a Savior who died on that cross in our behalf. And out of the riches of that brokenness, we find completeness and wholeness and healing. And we are set right with God, justified. Friend, if you have to choose between a tower and an altar, build the altar with God every time. Forsake tower building. Take your Bible and turn with me to Genesis 11, verse 1. We'll be focusing in the Tower of Babel story for the most part this morning. The Bible says in verse 1, Now the earth had one language and few words. And as men migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. So much is captured in this antediluvian post-world uh, world catechism statement. The whole world was all there was. Those who survived, those who grew from Noah's line, and they settled in a place called Shinar in a plain, unified with language and few words. So much is said here. First, a single language unified the world. We can deduce that from this. The Bible said the first language had few words. The Hebrew can also mean the same words. Humanity was able to communicate with itself because the language was plain, shared, and simple. When you get too highfalutin and too complicated, people don't understand you. I, I've met people who try to express themselves and they'll say, well, let us understand the existential nature of the deep philosophical impact of the transcendental feelings that contribute to the intrinsic notions of ontology. Now, how many of you understand a word of what I just said? They didn't communicate that way back then. They used a few words, simple, that everyone understood and people were together. This is why theologians in general mess it up because they make that which should be plain complicated. They make that which should be understood difficult. And that's why Plato envisioned them really in his book, The Republic, as philosopher kings. We don't need philosopher kings. We need preachers of righteousness who are clear. And the truth is deep, but it's clear. So humanity was able to communicate with itself. It is true that the formation of a social contract envisioned by Rousseau in his book, The Social Contract, takes a, a man from his noble, savage state in a society of sorts where life gets complicated once he enters into society. A social contract where words multiply, literature develops, relationships become defined, laws emerge. That's complicated. In the Genesis narrative, the Garden of Eden is to be found moving west from the east. East to west is the direction of the new Eden. Eden was planted from the east, but the new Eden is found in the west, in the narrative of Genesis. Abraham's sojourning brings him to the promised land in the west where the new Eden will be found in the future at the end of the millennium. 
The book of Hebrews says he was looking for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was moving forward to the future, to the place that would be the future. The word Shinar in the verses that we just looked at, verse 2, is associated with a few Hebrew words that are rich in meaning. Let me just walk you through them. I don't ex expect you to remember everything I'm saying, but bear with me. Will you bear with me? You know, I like doing this because I study for these things. I, I don't want to preach to you a bunch of nonsense. I really study. So let me not overdo it, but let me try to be clear. Sha'ar is one of the root words that's associated with Shinar. It expresses intense emotion and even violence. Na'ar means to shake or scatter, to growl. You know, when we practice the growl part, Grrr. could we? No? Grrr. You ever do that? Sure you have. You get mad at someone. Grrr. Grrr. I've seen people growl at me. I had a dog named Avalanche that would growl at me. He bit me one day. I had to teach him not to do that. Finally, I had to put him down, to shake, to scatter, to growl, to be young. It can also mean to be young. Isn't it true that kids scrap a lot? They sometimes fight. Come on. How many of you ever got into a conflict as a kid? Oh, you insulted my mama. No, I didn't. Smack, whack, you know, I did that. So scatter, to shake, to growl, to be young. Another verb, shanan, which means to be sharp or pointed. The word, Hebrew word for tooth comes from that. You bite something. You pierce something. The name shinar also contains in it the seed for ear, the Hebrew word for a city. You put it all together, and the name Shinar suggests a place full of youthful wit as a potential city with the potential for violence also, with struggle and conflict, scattering, disagreement, and all of this when the world was young. So when they formed that first city, it was not easy. I tell you, it's not easy today, the fight in the Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine. It looks like Ukraine's falling. Whatever the news is saying, Ukraine is not doing well in this war. Russia's advancing, it's getting that, e that eastern region. And who knows what the shape of Europe will be. War is awful. Shinar was the first picture of conflict in the Bible. The Bible says they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. The Hebrew word for there is sham. Why don't you say that with me? Sham. It sounds like a shaman. Sham. There. Sham. It is closely related to the Hebrew word shem. Probably shame in Hebrew. Shem. For name, Shem there, Shem, name. Now what person's named Shem in the Bible? It's easy to answer that one. Shem. Now you know what is the meaning of Shem's name. It means name. Shem was named the name. Shem is the name. His name means name. For the ancients, a name was something solid and firm because it is there like a rock. A name or a word is a thing. It's not just an idea. When you name something in the Bible, you define its existence. That's why Adam named all the animals. It's kind of like a quantum measurement in physics that forces an electron out of a subatomic or a subatomic part. It forces an electron or a subatomic particle, which isn't a particle yet, out of the cloud wave function, they call it, which is a state of possibilities. It forces it into the realm, a solid realm, of being a particle, of having a position just by measuring it. So when you name something, you measure it, you define it, you create its reality by naming. That's a biblical idea. In the Bible, the name of a person represents the character of that person. How many of you like your names? Raise your hand if you do. I love my name. How many of you like another name? Oh, a, few, a few hands went up. Well, do you realize that God's going to change all of our names based on our character? When, there, when a person's character changes, they often receive a new name. That was true of Jacob, who was named after a heel, suggesting deceit, trickery, and dominance. What was his name changed to? You know, changed to Israel. He was renamed Israel because he prevailed with God and man, and thus his name defined his character of the new man. The Bible suggests that we receive new names as we overcome in life and develop a Christ-like character. Christ knows our new name. The world that is to come, friend, now hear me, is not for losers. It's not for losers. Jesus said to him who overcomes, I will grant with him to sit with me on my throne. God has not called us to be losers as Christians. The world that is to come is for overcomers who will overcome in Jesus' name and receive a new name. 
Shem was named the name by Noah because he was to carry on the knowledge of the divine name Yahweh God, the name. In the Bible, God's name Yahweh and the Ten Commandment law of love revealed in Mount Sinai is the same thing, really. Now, why is this important? Twelve times God is known as Yahweh, Lord God, Jehovah God, Yahweh Elohim, until the serpent speaks to Eve. And when the serpent speaks, he leaves one of those two out. Which one do you think it is, Lord or God? He leaves out Lord. The word Yahweh, he says, has God said, which means he denies the covenant name of God to Eve. He will not put it on his lips. He does not allow himself to use that holy name that is God's character implied. The personal part of God, he does not affirm. He affirms God as a powerful being only. Because God's name Yahweh is who God is. Because in the Bible, God's name in the Ten Commandment law of love Revealed at Mount Sinai. Scripture reveals it's the same thing. Yahweh, I am who I am. That is my name, he tells Moses. The Ten Commandments, I am Yahweh Elohim, the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Instead of saying I am who I am in the Ten Commandments, he says I am the Lord who did this and here is the law that is a description of what the I am means. So the law is a revelation of the name of God. That's why in Psalms 119.55, it says when we meditate upon God's law, His name in the night, we keep His law. Because the two are the same. So the name of the beast at the end of time is the law of the beast, the character of the beast. God's law went on the forehead. God's name goes on the forehead in Revelation 14.1. The mark of the beast goes on the forehead and the hand where God's law, God's name should go. Why is it on the forehead? Because that's where character is contained. That's where the highest order of thinking occurs. God's law, God's name will be in us at the time of the end. We will own the high value system of who God is as Yahweh. So because God's name is Yahweh is who God is, it is the description of the I am who I am Yahweh God. So you do away the Ten Commandments of God, you're breaking the commandment that says you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You're violating the covenant by removing his name. The ten, so that's what the serpent did. He just he deleted the name. And then Eve said, has God said? She does too. And when she buys into that deletion, she loses, loses the knowledge of the covenant personal God that she had known 12 times stated before the serpent shows up. When sin has run its course... The Bible says there'll be no night in Revelation 22 for the Lord, the, the, God's name will be on our foreheads and the Lord God, the name is restored at the time of the end. Jesus came to restore the name. In John 17, he says, the name that you have given me before the world was made, the glory, the character of God, I have revealed it to them. I have revealed to them the words you gave me, just like Moses was given the ten words of the Ten Commandments. I have revealed your character, your law, in my life, my ministry is the gospel, the name. There is no true revival. Let me make a statement here. There's no true revival ever in the history of the world unless there is a heartfelt surrender to the personal claims of the divine law of God revealed at Sinai and demonstrated in love and bleeding at the cross of Calvary. So when the first revival came around, men began to call on the name of the Lord, and that was a good thing for us all, because the serpent had deleted the language. It had been lost in the experience of Eve. It comes back. It was 2,300 years before the year 457 B.C., right around there, when we find the line of Enosh, the son of Seth. And that, and that so it was 2,300 years before the autumn of 457 B.C. Now, what is 457 B.C. famous for in the Bible? It's the beginning of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem in Ezra 7, which is the beginning of what time prophecy? The 2300-year time prophecy. You know, we always go forward. From 457 B.C., 2300 years brings us to 1844, no year zero. But when you go backwards... You come to the line of Enosh when men begin to call on the name of the Lord for the first time in human history. 
The first revival in the history of the world is the model for the last revival at the time of the end defined by the 2300 year prophecy of Daniel when men and women will discover God's name, God's law, God's mercy, the gospel of God in Jesus, the, the meaning of who the prince of princes is in Daniel and the final revelation revival before Jesus returns at the time of the end. That's why we've been told in the spirit of prophecy that when the book of Daniel is rightly understood, there will be a whole new religious experience for God's people. Genesis 4, 25, 26. Let's look at that first revival. And Adam knew his wife again. She bore a son and called his name Seth. Seth in Hebrew means to put. Can you think of the promise where God said he would put something? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. The first promise of the Messiah with the verb put, seat, was used. And she names her son after the promise. Why? Because she thought maybe Seth was the Messiah. But he wasn't. It says, for she said, God has appointed or put for me another child instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. She thought Cain was the Messiah. He didn't crush the serpent's head. He crushed his brother's head. And then she named her son Seth after the promise, saying, I can't create a man like I claimed in Genesis 4.1. But God can appoint, can put for me the one who will get it done. She hoped he would be the Messiah. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Enosh in Hebrew means mortal man. And at that time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Think about it. When men and women begin to die, when sickness, when plague hit that antediluvian world, the ancient Jews in the, their, their work, the Jubilees, believed that a plague hit the world. And out of that, they named Enosh, representing the time of mortal man. And as people began to die, they realized the only hope they had was the mercy of God. So they began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, we've been living during the COVID crisis, haven't we? We've seen this thing just rip world culture apart. We are living at an optimal time when men and women can call on the name of the Lord. There's a sense of need in the world around us. And God's law contains the twin principles of mercy and justice in that order. The Bible says in Joel 2.32 and Acts 2.21 that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Will be saved. It's not an if, and, or maybe. It's an absolute certain statement. And that is why Noah named his son Shem, the name, because we need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. He wanted the knowledge of that first revival to move from the old world to the new world. He wanted the knowledge of the name of the Lord to not be lost, and thus Shem becomes the line of the name. Abraham will come from Shem. The Jewish people, I believe, rightly assert, and there's biblical evidence for this, that Shem will be Melchizedek. The Melchizedek that will bless Abraham will in fact be Shem, who moves from the, from the old world to the land of Canaan. Remember, Noah said that he would be a king in Canaan because Canaan would be a slave. Melchizedek was king of Salem, who had an advanced knowledge of God, who towered over the Canaanites. How, how, where, who, where did he come from? Friends, because we need to call on the name of the Lord be saved, we should not forget the meaning of Shem's name. As soon as men and women begin to call on the name of the Lord to be saved, in Genesis 4.26, notice in Genesis 5.1, open your Bibles, look at, the, look at the flow of the text. In Genesis 5.1, what does it say? Next thing, as soon as there is a revival, it says, there, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, generations means life-producing movements. This is the book of the life of Adam, the book of life. As soon as men begin to call on the name of the Lord, you have a book with life that is instantly introduced. We know that when we accept the Lord Jesus, our names are instantly written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world that goes back to the book of Genesis, right here in Genesis 5.1. This is the book of the generations of Adam when God created man, Adam. He made him in the likeness of God. <clears throat> Male and female, he created them. So Adam is both man and them. That's why it's okay to say mankind. It means woman and man. And he blessed them and named them man, Adam, when they were created. In the last book of the Old Testament, God reminds us that this book that was spoken of in Genesis 5.1 will be important in the judgment day. And that this first revival in history, in the history of the world, matters because it sets the, the, the pattern for all revivals that follow. Turn to Malachi 3, 14 to 18. Now, you're getting a Bible study today. Is that okay to have a Bible study in the pulpit? You know, I, I introduced it with a story. Stories are over. It's the Bible now, right? 
So, now, you have said, God says, he's speaking to the preachers of his day, you have said it is vain to serve God. Wow, what kind of preachers? They were. What is the good of our keeping his charge or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? Is that cynicism? Yes, it is. Henceforth, verse 15, we deem the arrogant blessed. Evil doers not only prosper, but when they put God to the test, they escape. That is how philosophical kings, preachers, preach today. When people bring that kind of skepticism to the pulpit, souls are lost. They, they ask cynical questions in God's face that puts God on trial as they frame his character in the wrong light to make themselves look good. Verse 16 is a direct allusion back to Genesis 4.26. The very first revival in the history of the world, God says, look, I'm going to take you back to where it works. In verse 16, he says, then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord heeded and heard them, and a book of remembrance, that's Genesis 5.1, was written before them on those who feared the Lord and thought on his name. That's Genesis 4.26. When men began to call on the name of the Lord, there was a book of remembrance, a genealogical record of life that was written for those who did. And God is saying, I know about that book. I know that it was written for those who think on my name, who care about my covenant and my law. And what, what's the result? Verse 17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. My special possession on that day when I act. And I like this. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. You want to be spared? Call on the name of the Lord. Then once more you shall distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. See, you're, you're not righteous or wicked because you've made mistakes in life. You're righteous if you call on the name of the Lord in your life. If you ask for God's salvation in your life and you seek his character in your life, as flawed though you be as you work on that and grow in grace, you're in Christ. So thence once more you shall distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. So it matters if we learn how to call on the name of the Lord in life because whoever calls on the name of the Lord with a sincere heart seeking mercy will be saved by a sincere God of mercy. The word for name in Hebrew is Shem because Shem means name. And that is why Shem matters in the narrative. The Tower of Babel story is found right smack in the middle of the genealogy of Shem, the name. It's an attack upon the name. The tower builders will have nothing to do with the Shem, the name. Back to Genesis 11.3. All that's to make this verse make sense. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top into the heavens. That's the first big tree house. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. The tower builders are playing God in front of God here. Three times they say, let us, let us. Let us, just like God said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then he blessed them. So they're playing God with this let us language. These tower builders are, not to build a, are out to build a tower for the future without God. With God-like power assumed in humanity. They even say, now notice this, they even say, let us make a name for ourselves. Now what is the Hebrew name for, for name? I've just shared it with you. Shem. Let us make a Shem name for ourselves. Shem was alive. He was there. Now you know why Moses, not Moses, Noah said Shem would end up in the land of Canaan. They rejected him in that place. He eventually moves west. We don't want to call, they're saying we don't want to call on the name of the Lord, the Shem of the Lord, like the name Shem suggests. Forget what Noah said by naming Shem, Shem. We want to be our own God, develop our own laws, and do our own thing without God. Let us, let us, let us, and let God get out of here. Have you ever had said that in your own life? It's easy. Why did they build a tower? The ancients built towers to model the universe and to control it also. You see a picture of the pyramids. Those pyramids are aligned with the constellation of Orion. Most people don't realize that. When you look on the ground from space, it resembles what you look at in, uh, above. Go to the next slide. The Orion mystery, you can see the three prominent stars. It matches the outline of the great pyramids, pyramids of Giza. 
They believe that if you can climb up to heaven, you can harness the power of the gods and the stars themselves by the power of the tower. In, Genesis, in Deuteronomy 4.19, God said to Moses, you shall not worship the host of heaven, for it has been given over the nations. See? But it's not your inheritance. You're to worship me. Man can do anything if he, man can do anything if he builds a tower that's high enough and strong enough, they thought. So let's build it strong, high, and tall. And that is why they would, they would build their altars on the high place mounds because they believed that if you have to be good, smart, gifted, strong, high, enough to climb up to God on your own. That is why God commanded his people to never build his altar on a high place mound to resemble a tower in any way. Why? Here's why. Because we don't climb up to God. God comes down to us. Big difference. When his people build a simple altar with no artistic work on it, in Exodus 20 commanded, it would, God commanded them to do this so the altar would not look pretty. It would not have to have steps so you climb up to it so that God would come down. And where his name is remembered, when an altar was built on level ground from simple stones, he would come down. His presence would be manifested. He would be there with the person who knelt at that altar. And thus the tower builders are always trying to climb up to God so God will accept them because of their good efforts, their perfection, or anything else. See, religious people can be tower builders. All they got to do is come up with a system of works that makes them feel like they arrived. Friend, I want to be perfect, but not in my way. I don't want any kind of perfection It's based on me talking to myself like I'm a good person. It's in my brokenness I find a Savior. It's in my sense of sinfulness. I am blessed with grace. And when I think I've arrived is when I'm not there. In contrast, the true worshipers of God build altars on level ground because they remember the character of a kind God who comes down in humility to save them in their brokenness and need. God told the children of Moses when he was at the burning bush, I have heard of the affliction of my people. I know what their taskmasters have done to them. And I have come down. The attitude of the tower builders is righteousness by works full of pride that lifts you high. The attitude of those who build an altar God's way and who don't try to climb up to God, who build an altar on level ground, in humility kneel at that altar. That attitude is the attitude of righteousness by faith. Exodus 20, verse 22. And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. I'm a personal God. I'm not this distant deity who doesn't care about you. Verse 23. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, or literally in my face, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. So money can't be your God, friend. Look at verse 24. An altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, and every place where I cause my name, Shem, to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stones. For if you wield your tool upon it, you profane it. And you shall not go up to my steps, uh, go up by steps to my altar. <laughs> you don't climb up to my altar that your nakedness be exposed, not exposed upon it. Now the latest in church is naked. Why? Because the latest in church is conditions, righteousness by works. It is a bankrupt religious experience because you cannot climb up to the altar. You have to kneel at the altar and God comes down. No pretty altars and no climbing up to God are allowed in order to find him. God says, just come to me. Jesus said, come unto me all you who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, which is the law of God, upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart and you will find rest for your souls. God says, just come to me on your knees and level ground and call on my name, Hashem, the name, and I will come to you. In the narrative, God came down to inspect those tower builders, and he found them unwilling to call on his name because they were too busy making a name for themselves in that narcissistic place. Narcissism and self-worship is always at the heart of false religion. And where self is enthroned, friend, God can never be king in the heart. That is why God has to tear down our towers so we can learn in life to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. When you look good, you're not saved. When you look good to you, you're not saved. When you realize you're a sinner and you need a Savior to do things right is when 
You fulfill the condition when Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Genesis eleven six, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. And there confused their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad and from there over the face of the whole earth. And they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused. That's the verb balau in Hebrew to mix. Mixed or confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And that's how we got the conflict of nations. That's how we get wars. That's how we get people to understand anymore each other. It all comes from Babel. Can you think of an event where people came together and everyone understood the language instead of not understanding? That would be when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And the prophet Zephaniah said the day will come when God's people will worship Him in one accord with a pure speech. He's predicting the Feast of Pentecost as the reversal of the Tower of Babel. When God's people would hear the gospel in prophetic terms proclaimed and no barrier from any nation on the face of the earth would prevent the clear word of God from being heard and it would bring people back together again. Friend, the first angel's message is a reapplication of the apostolic message at the time of the end before Jesus returns. It's in the context just before 1844, leading up to the coming of Christ, there will be a, a gospel message, and there has been, but more so to every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. And the Tower of Babel, in time Babylon comes down. So they wanted to gather in their own name, so God scattered them because of His name. They lost their unity in their striving to build on it. They lost the gift of one language in their attempt to improve it. They lost their ability to continue building the city in their boastful climb and claim that they could rise to greater heights on their own. And so the tower builders gave up building the tower because God intervened. God stopped it. God tore down the tower, so to speak. In the end, friend, the best efforts of man can never create a new world order that is able to climb up to God. It could not happen. Why? Because all our towers come down in time. We can't build the future on our own. In the book of Revelation, end time Babylon is a religious system. It's a Christian corrupted religious system at the time of the end. That was the medieval church state system of the Middle Ages re-expressed as a socialist Marxist reality at the time of the end. When people surrender civil liberties around the world, where eco-religion joins the medieval religion, saving the planet is more important than saving souls. And as a result of this, the world descends into its final crisis when no man can buy or sell, when every principle of the Constitution has been repudiated, as the prophet to the remnant church has said. And this final crisis that we are facing, friends, you can't afford to be in any ism but Christ. I don't care if it's the left or the right, you better be in Jesus. Because the two get together at the time of the end. And if you think it's in one party or another, you're in the wrong party. I'm voting for Jesus Christ and his kingdom today in this pulpit. By rejecting Bible truth, end time Babylon will try and make a name for itself. By creating a new world order where everyone agrees because they are told to by religious authorities or the state, finally they will say you must break the fourth commandment of the law of God. Now if we can compromise on the sixth commandment, we will break the fourth commandment. That's a fact. If we compromise on the second commandment, we will break the fourth commandment. Because all are one. The ten are a description of God's holy covenant Yahweh name. So you break one, you break them all. No church claiming to be the people of God on earth has a right to force, manipulate, or control the conscience of another human being or any believer. Let every man be persuaded. Every woman be persuaded in their own mind. The book Great Controversy, we are told that the principle of compulsion force is contrary to the principles of God's kingdom. That God uses none of it. He uses truth and evidence to win people to his cause. The other is the spirit of Antichrist. In Babylon, the harlot in the book of Revelation commits fornication with the beast power, the kings of the earth, the ten kings, by uniting church and state in an oppressive form that will enforce the mark of the beast at the time of the end. Revelation 18.4. Here's the last message of this world. How many of you believe in the three angels' messages? Did you know there are four? Now, the Millerites only thought there were two. 
even though they were reading the third one. They just didn't know what it meant, and they didn't even focus on it. Not until 1844 did the third angel's message come online. And when that was being taught, James White, Ellen White, others realized it drew us to the Sabbath. The, rest, the worship of the beast have no Sabbath rest in the mark of the beast issue. The fourth commandment, it even ends with saying, here are those who keep the commandments of God. Because one has been forgotten. Sabbatarianism came online in the second great awakening after 1844, the third angel's message. But the fourth angel's message, the world is illumined with the glory of the fourth angel in Revelation 18.1. It is a global message of undiluted power that will reach to the ends of the earth. And men and women who have never heard the truth, even if they don't understand its logic, the power of the Holy Spirit will compel them based on the unction of God and His Word to get out of Babylon because Babylon is a corrupt religious order at the time of the end that will have killed people in the mark of the beast issue. And in that final call, they will come. Now, there was a dry run of this in 1843 to 44. When Charles Fitz preached his famous sermon of 1843, Babylon is, is falling, get out of Babylon now, that church, that sermon created the Seventh-day Adventist church. Charles Fitch stood in the pulpit and he declared that there must be a people in the face of the earth who take the Bible and the Bible only, who are faithful to its teachings, who don't philosophy away its clear, its clear revelation, and that was the beginning of what would become the Seventh day Adventist movement that weathered the great disappointment of 1844. Those people appealed to their friends and neighbors to get out of their churches because Christ was coming. They thought in the year 1844. The same will happen at the very end. There are people outside our ranks who are godly Christians, who rev revere the Word of God, who don't know the Sabbath truth, because some of us have taught it legalistically. So how can you grab the Sabbath if you don't see Jesus as the center of the thing? But that will change in the mark of the beast issue. And a large number of those, we are told, will take their stand for the Lord and they will give that final warning as they appeal to their families and friends to get out of these relationships that have kept them away from the truth. And at that point in time, when the fourth angel's message, the loudest of all, the one that repeats the second angel, is given, the earth is illumined with its glory, and there's one people ready for the coming of Christ. God has healed the rift in the Protestant world, in the Christian world, because there will be one people who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The Reformation gave us righteousness by faith. You know, don't dog the Reformation. But Adventism was led to the knowledge of the Sabbath through prophetic fulfillment. And the mark of the beast, godly Christians around the world will get it. And they will be a commandment-keeping righteousness by faith kind of keeping people at the time of the end. I get excited about that. I get excited because we are living just before the loud voice of the third angel's message. It hasn't happened. There are voices in our denomination. I've heard them. A former professor of mine at the seminary. I'm not going to mention him by name. But who has this new theory going around that there will be no Sunday law because Sister White didn't know what she was talking about. She was just basically just hopeful. And he has a nice theory. He calls her a classical prophet. As if classical prophets don't tell the truth. And I am amazed at how many of my associates take this seriously. This is a direct attack upon the third angel's message. We are living on the eve of its proclamation. And we cannot afford to be fooling around with nonsense in our study of the Bible. I am challenging you not to take my word, but to study the scriptures for yourself. At the end of Shem's genealogy, God calls Abram from Ur of the Chaldees to leave the land of Babylon. That's the fourth angel's message stuff at the time of the end. You can't build an altar that is right with God. And God can't bless you when you're trying to climb up to God in your life on your own terms. Ur means light in Hebrew. Abraham left Ur, the land of light. Satan always masquerades as an angel of light. The world offers its own version of truth, light, science, philosophy. And God says, leave it all behind for the faith and the journey. You may not have all the answers, but follow my word. You're going to make it. You won't find me and my blessing in the land of tower builders, God says. Get out. So get out and go to the place that I will show you with my light and my way. Genesis 2.1, I love this call of Abraham. It's like the fourth angel's message in Revelation. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, 
from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. That's everything those tower builders wanted to do. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. <laughs> See, they wanted to make for themselves a name. I'll make your name great. Your Shem great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Two chapters later, Melchizedek shows up and blesses him. As I said, heavy evidence that Melchizedek is Shem. He probably would have been a Denisovan, eight to nine feet tall, standing over little Abram and blessing him, just like Noah had blessed him after the flood, passing it on by direct line, the sacred line of the name. At the age of 75, Abram took his wife and his possessions and his nephew Lot, and he left the town called Light to go to the place where God blessed, would bless him and show him the way. Sometimes we wonder why God doesn't bless us right away in our, our life, right? Why can't I have it right now? Friend, God can't bless you when you are on the wrong ground. He can't bless you unless you leave the bad place for the good place in life. He can't bless you unless you forsake the land of tower builders for a good place that God will show you where to build that holy altar for his name's sake. I would rather have many altars than a church building. Altars like Vespers, prayer meeting, Bible studies, then a building. I'm grateful for our building. Abraham is famous in the book of Genesis for building one altar after another in the Holy Land. He didn't build towers. Abraham built altars, and so should we. You can't climb your way out of your troubles in life, but you can pray your way out of trouble as you go to God on your knees on level ground, build an altar. You can't fix your faulty character by trying harder and harder. It's impossible. Climbing higher and higher like the tower builders, but you can fall on your knees in humility and brokenness and call on the name of the Lord. And Jesus can fix your life. Every deficiency of character can be supplied. Every fault corrected. Every excellence de developed when you fall on your knees. As he forgives you, restores you, changes you, empowers you with the Holy Spirit, blood and water, forgiveness and Holy Spirit power on level ground, at the altar. And so Abraham went to Shechem, to the Oak of Morah. Tall trees are natural towers. As I said, they represented cosmic trees. He thought that maybe that would help him find God at a cosmic tree. Paradoxically, God met him at that tree when he appeared to him at the Oak of Morah because he wanted to meet him. God meets us where we are at. Abraham had incomplete understandings. But Abram kept on going, kept on growing, kept on knowing till he grew up to be the mighty father of faith. His journey in the Bible is the movement from east to west, unless he got tempted. In which direction did he go when he got tempted? South to Egypt, which is worldliness. We, like him, move from east to west and we're walking with God. But when worldliness comes in the church, we go south to Egypt. The philosophies of worldliness of Egypt permeate the church because of compromise. Abram had to come back and get back on the road. The west is the sunset of life. The east represents the dawn of life. He's moving from the beginning to the end. The book of Hebrews says he's looking for a city in the future that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Every life has a beginning that is in the east, and every life has an end that moves toward the west. And like Abram, we too journey also from east to west. Now here's the question. Where is God to be found in this journey from east to west that is the life journey? We live in the middle of east and west, don't we? The beginning and the end. Where is God on the hard road and often the lonely road that is the life road moving from east to west? Turn to Genesis 12, 7 and 8. Open your Bibles one more time. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built there an altar of the Lord who appeared to him. Thence he removed to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And I like this. And there he built an altar to the Lord between east and west. And he called on the name of the Lord like they did in that first revival in Genesis 4.26. One man, not a lot, doing the right thing. The hope of the world, the faith of Abraham. Ai means to bend or twist in Hebrew. 
C.S. Lewis called Satan the bent one because sin is a perversion of God's natural order. It bends and twists his law and will. Bethel means the house of God. Abram built the altar with Ai to the east and Bethel to the west. Friend, every believer leaves sin like Ai behind in his or her journey west to Bethel, the house of God that will appear at the end of time. We live between east and west. Abram didn't wait to build an altar. When he arrived at Bethel, that's the future. He was looking for a city that has foundations. Bethel represents that, the house of God. Abram didn't wait to build an altar at Bethel. Abram built his altar on the way to Bethel, to the house of God. He built his altar between the beginning and the end of things. That represents every day of our life. Between east and west, Abram called on the name of the Lord. Every day of his life, in the middle of his life, and so should we. And that is the place where God found him and blessed him and kept him and grew him between east and west is where we live today. Not at the perfect outcome of God's journey, but right now when we're struggling with imperfection. Dear heart, stop building towers to prove yourself to God. And start calling on the name of the Lord to be saved every day of your life before the sun sets in the west, before the kingdom of God comes in all its glory at the end of time. Friend, today is the day of salvation. God and Jesus will be your best friend on the hard and lonely road. And God and Jesus will show you the way home. So take up your cross and follow him, calling on his name. How many of you choose to call on the name of the Lord? To not build a tower to God, but to call on the name of the Lord where you live in life. All the way home, he'll hold your hand. He'll lead you. So never stop building those altars, vespers, prayer meeting, prayer home circles, your personal devotional life. Never stop building those altars. Towers or altars? Altars. Build altars. Build altars. My name is Pastor Michael Oxentanko, and we're just so happy that you're checking into our sermon content at Reaching Hearts SDA Church on YouTube. I want to really encourage you to hit the subscribe button. And if you want more of our preaching, teaching, just go to the playlist and, and you'll see it laid out there. Again, thank you so much for being a part of our gospel preaching, teaching ministry.